they, they kind of made friends at the end. And then went back to Athens, everyone's very sad, they think Bottom's dead. And then this is startling being the moon in the play within the play. Uh, and he's basically, his moon is a balloon with a light bulb in it. Uh, and everyone thinks that's very nice. And then at the end of the piece, there's a big dance where everybody sort of, and in this production, everybody played, uh, the court people played fairy people. So everyone had a yin and yang of, of their personality. So he had been overall and Theseus, she'd been Hippolyta and uh, Titania, and that's bottom. So they have a kind of memory that they've actually shagged. So when they have the dance, there's a kind of a free song between them. And that's Starling at the back who appeared and, get, you know, and summoned the balloon to be the moon. And then as he, the dance carried on, more and more balloons kind of flew in to join him. So that by the end, you had Puck surrounded by all these floating balloons, which were with light bulbs in them. Uh, and it had snowed at the beginning, and then at the end, we ended up throwing grass onto the stage. So we had the stage grow up above, throwing real fresh grass down, so you could get the smell of that coming through. A quick example here of again two different uh, productions of the same of the, the same play, Twelfth Night. One in Dundee with a, a, an abandoned room with a storm that's kind of broken through the window of it. And that's Feste at the end of the play. It's almost like he's being locked in and sand is pouring onto him. And then this was doing it only two years later, but meanwhile there'd been the, the tsunami in the Pacific. So the idea of actually illustrating crashing storms and things buried in sand was a bit too topical. And we began in a different place with the obsession that the Duke has for his love, and these are her eyes up there. And then, uh, if music be the food of love, is a famous quote from that play, and there, uh, the band were there. And then, to get out of that scene into a storm, we just flew everything into the air. So the piano, the music stands, everything started flying. Uh, and other people sort of flew by her, kind of came in as if she was drowning. Uh, his twin brother flew in in a boat. Of course he had vertigo, uh, that actor, what <laughs> well, we had to deal with. Um, and then that's Feste at the end, the obsession was gone, that wall flew away, the huge garden at the back, and all these hanging bits of music. Uh, different actors, different directors. And then this one is another kind of thing about the journey of a play. And again, for me, the sense of community and what kind of theatre can do. That we began in a very closed, sterile world, very Elizabethan uh, kind of a, a floor <coughs> and a wall of parquet uh, in, in the courtyard space. Full on kind of uh, Elizabethan costume. Then as we went into the forest, the space broke up. And gradually over the course of the play, their clothes subtly changed. So each time they went off, they lost bits and, and more and more contemporary elements were sort of gradually introduced. So that you know, he went from boots to converse, to from a leather jacket to a, uh, it all gradually got kind of more modern. And the whole space got kind of broken up and poetry and letters were put everywhere. And then when the audience went out at the end, that poetry had been put up by the crew in the foyer and right down the streets, so the whole kind of feel of love and love poetry carried on all the way down. And that's their kind of wild party then. So in the course of that journey, you know, you went from that, that rigid Elizabethan into a communal sharing with the audience in, in a very contemporary sort of country way. Other times, there's a very specific brief, so this was a collaboration with uh, 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 director Luke Iqbal Khan on Much Do About Nothing, which wanted to set in, in India. So. Luckily, that involved a trip to India for research, which was an amazing kind of privilege to do, and converting the courtyard theatre into Haveli architecture with a kind of tree that went into the space and then mixed with all the electrical cables like most trees in Delhi seem to do. And then at the end of that piece, uh, two of the bits slid away and it rained and rain kind of poured through the piece. This is the kind of mock funeral in much ado. And then more recently, um, again, for me, the power of imagination on, on the theatre stage. This was Christmas Truths, which was uh, a story about the famous football match that kind of took place on Christmas Day when uh, the Germans and the British stopped fighting. And they kind of offered that brief moment of hope that perhaps you know, there, was, there was another way out, sadly crushed. Uh, and the Warwickshires, which where Stratford is, were, were a regiment involved in that. Again, it's in, a court, it's in a thrust space. There is a kind of decorative element at the back, a kind of landscape and these sort of curtains, which are like abstract green trees, 
all began with a cricket match. That's what that is there. And this is them doing rifle training. And then to make the trenches, one of the things, the, the challenge, I suppose, the attribute is a trench is a very difficult thing. You get bogged down in it in naturalistically, so you can't actually make a trench in theatre. So we took with us on our journey into France all the props and things that we had when we'd been at the village fate. We began with so there were step ladders, there were chairs, there were bales of straw and boxes, and we added in these things which are actually First World War uh, camp beds, but upside down they have a rather wonderful quality of sort of barbed wire. So that was then creating a trench, and our visual kind of cameras that were moved down, so we shared their viewpoint, and that trench at the top became the new horizon. This is then going to, to war in, in the kind of a, a battle moment just before the Christmas. That's actually them in, the, in with the audience and about to go up on stage. And then uh, nurses, in a rather abstract way, uh, in what happened in, genuinely was that they had a terrible battle just before Christmas, and then they were stranded, and then a fog came down, and it was their way of escaping. So this was the fog arriving with the nurses singing Ave Maria, and at that point, at the back, all these trees broke up so that you it got a, a fragmented battle torn thing. And I think we then established that actually at the top of a trench is the top of a step ladder. So we then created a scene where actually this is right downstage, and there are just these two ladders, and this is the, the British Tommies in their trench just before uh, Christmas night. And you can just see there the lights at the distance of Christmas trees that have appeared. And then this is the Germans coming over to take <coughs> the and just to show it's not all Shakespeare, uh, and that it can be small scale, this was a, a show at the Royal Court upstairs, a new play set in a school in Sittingbourne. Uh, so a rather less glamorous field trip to Sittingbourne this time. Uh, but actually just as important to kind of see the environment, that actually it's about working class poverty, but in a very rural setting. And this school was right in the middle of fields. Uh, and the play is set in two places. It's in the uh, playground of the school and in the kitchen. Uh, and we end up with this sculptural shape that suggests a house that, and then around it, this is real grass, and then painted on the walls is the landscape of, of Sittingbourne. So it's both an evocation of that landscape, uh, but abstracted. And then to go to the kitchen scene, we just brought in those bits of furniture. And actually, we didn't need a kitchen. You know, they talked, maybe we might, we might want to make a sandwich, and they have made it, so we didn't need a cupboard. We didn't need that filmic TV mattress. And, all we needed was a bottle of vodka with a red top. And then this is an example of kind of some of the exhibition design that I've done, which is also about a kind of narrative and about this was Shakespeare's stage in the world at the British Museum. And it, um, it began with a big abstract wooden O, and above it radiating these rays, which were above the first folio this day below. So it was almost like everything stemmed from those words. And then, as, then you kind of, I would call them the audience, would walk through a series of, of rooms and spaces that take you on a journey through different environments and through finally into a kind of revelation at the end of an entirely white, almost like a gallery room at the end. Uh, and we used the same language and materials. So this was plywood that here is uh, cut into strips with uh, Shakespearean text giving an almost like an abstract breakup like uh, from leaves, that's the countryside element. And this is the witchcraft section where the plywood was all blasted with uh, as if it's been burnt and red for all, all the exhibits. And then what you've already been waiting for, thank you for staying with me up to this point. <coughs> so, second half, uh, wake up everybody. This is Glossary um, uh, Lands and Seas of Red. So, there's always been a lot about this in, in the media and, and, and lots of things. So, and you're getting kind of my version of it. It's an interesting, strange collaboration that came out, not something I was expecting. Uh, I thought it was going to be a job that was going to last about three weeks, uh, and it's still, it's still going. Um, it began with Paul's central idea of one poppy per life. He approached the Tower of London. He happened to know somebody called, uh, or in fact, there's a guy at the Tower of London called John Brown, who scarily is titled that head of security and operations. He's actually a lovely man, but very good at organizing things. And he had a friend called Paul Cummings, who wasn't this Paul Cummings. So when Paul Cummings ran up and wanted to talk to somebody, he took the call, and Paul started talking to him about this idea. So he said, okay, come in and, and talk to us. They also had working for them newly, a woman called Deborah Shaw, who had been at the RSC working as a producer on our uh, World Shakespeare Festival. Uh, 
And she kind of said to Paul, well, I think, you know, it is such an enormous undertaking. I think you're going to need somebody else to collaborate with, someone who, you know, has an experience of large scale kind of work. So they, they say, so they called me in. Um, and initially, my brief was, such as there was a brief, was, you know, to help design the installation. So I said, well, does that mean I can actually design it? So um, what Paul's original vision was, which is, it, it is very, is great, is the entire motors fill the pockets. <coughs> but when I was looking at it, and it inspired by the same poem that he was inspired by of uh, the blood, sweat, lands, and seas of red, the idea of a metaphor, which for me in theatre is such an easy thing, you know, the feathers becoming snow, the red feathers becoming blood in the snow, the sand falling like dust, the, the, the things that we do all the time in theatre where we uh, invite the audience on a, a imaginative journey to see one thing and then transform it into something else. Uh, so I said, well, you know, can we engage with the building? Can I start treating it like a liquid? Um, it was where, oh, sorry, go back it was where famously the city pals all joined up. So there's that kind of ghostly evocation of all of those people uh, recruited in the note. And then this was the kind of initial plan. Uh, and I thought that people wouldn't know what was going on. So, so I decided that we should make three episodes that would sort of draw the eye from afar, because obviously the moat you can't see into when you're nowhere near it. Uh, and so from the tube, there ought to be something you could see, just in case you didn't know it was happening. Uh, and from over there, uh, and then from the way, the, this way bit here, you would see from over the river. Uh, and then I also started mapping out uh, an idea of different heights, so that you could have uh, the, sh the sense of contours moving through it. At that point, we also thought we might have people walking through it, so there might be routes, there might be com places you can contemplate stuff, uh, there might be performance happening. Uh, these were my first little sketches of uh, a weeping window and what I called over the top, which was the one that got less pictures. And then this is a kind of model which we started and then gave up because there was just too much work, really. Uh, you can see about four <laughs> model <laughs> of these down there. Uh, but it was looking at the shapes and translating that into a, into a sort of hand-drawn sketch. And then this was the first model of the wave and, and looking at how that might be supported. English Heritage were really worried about this. They didn't like the idea of it blocking out the, uh, the tower. And I think one of the journeys that we had to go on uh, as a team was convincing the organisation of the Tower of London to come with us uh, and that it was going to be worth doing. Some people never really did come with us. We had to recruit our own health and safety person because they didn't want to touch it because of the volunteering aspect. Uh, and actually, the Tower of London didn't really have a proper contract for me. I was in, contracted a bit like a scaffolder. They, didn't, they never really worked with artists. So, and I'm the one man that I don't have huge public indemnity. You know, I go to other people, I go to workshops, I work with production managers, I bring teams of people with me. Uh, and yet suddenly they were asking me to sort of say that this thing wasn't going to fall over. And I was like, well, the builders are made sure it doesn't fall over. <laughs> um, and the other problem I felt is that actually there was too much of the structure. You could see the structure and I, and I explored, you know, should that be evocations of trench architecture? Because uh, for me, this was sort of an abstraction of the men going over the top. Um, and so this was a sketch thinking, well, can we just use the poppies? So they're just the rods, almost like it's the etilated little, each one is an etilated poppy that's sort of uh, drawn up. Uh, and then that's sort of how the, the curve might develop. Oh, yeah. And then here, the difficulty of drawing it on CAD. Oh, sorry about that one. Ah, there So, and there, they, actually, that's it, the ambulance. Um, up until the day they started installing this, I hadn't heard about the fact that we needed to get an ambulance across this bridge. Um, and the builders rang up in a panic and said, we, we, we're going to have to move it back because they need to get an ambulance through. Um, and so they were, they were proposing to site the whole thing kind of way back there, there'd be a huge gap. And I had to sort of fight and go, oh, actually, can we make sure, can you draw an ambulance in the picture and see whether we can get them through? Uh, and they agreed in the end, so we were able to keep it as close as I wanted it to be. Oh, oh, it's changing something weird now. Anyway. Um, so this was the development of the plan. There was a moment when we thought we might have poppies in the middle that would flow down, but this was too archaeologically sensitive. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't bang them into the ground there, and we couldn't afford to make 
the frames that we need to put them down there. Uh, this became a, uh, that was our grassy knoll, which was where the event of the uh, 150 names that were read out every night, which the public could nominate, which I did one night, which was a very uh, sort of moving, sort of and terrifying thing to do with a bugler behind you. Um, and then, these are the early samples where Paul was struggling to find a glaze that would give you the kind of the deep red, but we were looking at how many we needed per square meter. So we got to about 50. And this is Paul in his workshop with all of the, uh, the sort of, hand, each copy handmade. In the end, they had to go out to about four different workshops to make them. Um, all done by hand. That's John Brown, the guy from the tower who sort of made it all happen. And the final ones. And then going back to my structures, I went to one builder with the idea of this way. Their, their design was for me was too linear, too much like a sort of constructivist sculpture. They didn't bend anything. They were also way too expensive. Uh, used to doing fashion shows. Uh, like with Simon Kenny, who you made, and then open souvenir. Um, and then so we went down to Plymouth to a workshop down there uh, and there was a brilliant welder called Martin who happened to be a theatre designer who kind of took the idea and ran with it uh, and created these are sort of samples for it and they created these wonderful sort of twisted structures that it was an amazing amount of welding all of that sort of stuff and that's Martin there uh, and this was the, the piece the form that they had to go with it. We got to an interesting point in the project, June 24th, 14, <coughs> where it became very apparent that we weren't going to have, we were going to have a logistics crisis, that we weren't going to have enough copies to do the project. We thought, uh, and this is sort of confidential, um, <laughs> we, we, we thought that, well the original plan had been that we would get all of them and we would plant them from the 17th of July through to the 4th of August, and we would do the whole lot. I'm not quite sure how we thought we were going to do it, but the whole lot with, with a lot of volunteers, and everybody was geared up for this. We then discovered that actually this wasn't going to happen. That was a point when actually the Tower of London nearly pulled out. They, they got very nervous about it. They'd been very nervous for quite a long time about the project. They didn't do any pre-publicity, they didn't do any pre-marketing, they didn't create any products to go with it. The only product in the end was the poppy. Um, and so on a train with John and uh, Deborah uh, back from Paul's workshop, we were, well, what are we going to do? Are we, you know, there must be a way that we can deliver this. We've got the Royal Family booked in, you know, Kate and Will are coming on the 4th of August. So will there be anything there? And I said, we could be really bold and they could plant the first poppy. <laughs> um, and you're all nerd, and that's the work, you know, that's, that's just going a bit too far. So we went, to, so I looked at what can we do with about 80,000. Uh, and so we thought we would keep the, 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 the weeping window over the top and the wave, we'd make those structures, and then we'd feed it all together and join it like a little thin thing, so that it's those things that are causing uh, the event to happen. And then we're just going to have to get a lot more volunteers and maybe nobody will come. Um, so this was a, a very quick sketch of how the beginning might look. It might go round like that. And then it could look like that, but more likely probably like that. Um, and luckily the tower supported that idea. I think they felt they had committed sort of so far and they got that balance or actually they couldn't not do it, I think. Um, so we did, we did sort of steam ahead. So this is the installation of the way. It took about sort of five days. Nobody knew what we were doing. All, you know, 